I have something very, very exciting to share with you. And it all begins with these. This is a kitten. Um, they're very common. You probably have seen one before. There are actually 600 million of these alive in the world today. Now this is a cheeseburger. There are only 120 million of these in existence at any given moment. However, this is the human population of the Earth, and that is seven billion people. There are now seven billion people alive on this planet today. That's a threshold that was just passed this month. Now, not only are there seven billion people, an unprecedented number, we can see that since the major mass human die-off, there's been nothing but population growth. More and more humans on this planet all the time. We're on track to potentially have 10 billion human beings alive on the Earth by the year 2050, and yet only 120 million hamburgers. That means that some of these starving children are not going to get hamburgers. And that's making these kittens very nervous. It worries me too. Uh, human population is, is the problem of the future. What are we going to do? How are we going to get some meat for those children? The UN says that of the seven billion people who are alive today, over one billion of them are hungry and or starving and or dying right now due to a lack of meat. What can we do about that? There have been many suggestions. People looking into the future say, we need to start eating more bugs. <laughs> This has been a serious suggestion by a number of scientists. Just train the palate to enjoy bugs. It's also been suggested jellyfish, uh, a, another sort of pestilentially growing organism that doesn't taste very good at all and is not all that nutritious either. But there's a lot of it. There's a lot of them. They're hungry. Feed it to them. It's been suggested. It's also been suggested uh, that we eat worms, that we use human waste to raise worms and that we eat those worms uh, and that we deal with the consequences of that, which could be disgusting. It's even been suggested that we eat this stuff, tofu, in large abundance, despite the huge agronomic consequences of dedicating that much arable land to the creation of a pretty much flavorless substance. I don't know if any of those are the right solutions. I have an interesting job. I'm an author of fiction. And when people ask me, what do I do? I say, I create imaginary solutions to real problems. In my most recent book, the Cannibal's Guide to Ethical Living, I made a suggestion on how we can deal with the impending meat crisis that's awaiting all of us. I said, let's eat millionaires. <laughs> they look delicious, and I think that this potentially could be achievable. It would be a simple process. You'd have to have a sort of a propaganda campaign leading to some organization to create sort of some teams to sort of <laughs> sweep through major populated areas to collect millionaires. Uh, there would probably be some kind of legal process required in order to make it all kosher with the Constitution. And after that, a, a variety of serving suggestions are possible, uh, including, you know, rotisserie is not a bad one. It depends on what you're into. Other people might like cold cuts. Uh, you know, it's a suggestion, it's a sort of a farcical one, but what's interesting is that in researching this book, I learned that millionaires are in fact one of the healthiest and most satisfying things that you can eat. It turns out that they're incredibly low in fat, saturated and unsaturated. They're pretty decent on the cholesterol side. They're, the calories, you know, they're a lot leaner than, than deer or spiders, and uh, they're high in protein. And, and most significantly, their suffering levels are way lower than factory farmed animals such as chickens or even free range animals such as, um, no, there aren't any left, are there? Uh, their suffering's even less than spiders. So it's fun to suggest these things, it's fun to imagine, it's fun to cogitate and propose. There are, of course, some real world problems with eating millionaires as a sustainable movement going forward. Uh, the supply is a really obvious one. If you do the math, and it's not that hard to do, if the 1%, as we know them, who own and control everything, who have all of the power and all of the money, if we were to take those people and cut them up, <laughs> and serve them to the other 99% of humanity, well, you can see that may be appealing, but really it's only 1 99th of a millionaire per hungry person. <laughs> 
that's about a pound of flesh after processing. And it could be delicious, but only for like one meal. And then where do you go? You know, probably some kind of progressive taxation structure is, uh, you know, a better long-term approach, and it's a bit more civilized. And that's another thing. Uh, more than the supply problem, there's an ethical problem. <laughs> Could you eat this? I couldn't eat this. <laughs> Human beings empathize with one another. And millionaires are, to some degree, human beings. Now, you can feel their pain when they ever have it. Uh, it's a long-standing taboo against eating human flesh for really obvious reasons. It'd be, you know, it'd be like eating kittens. And, and these taboos, you know, these decisions about what you can and can't eat for ethical reasons are gonna have a huge effect on the, the future food chain. I'll give you an example. Here's some delicious uh, pork ribs. These taste really good. They smell great, they're juicy, they, they fall right off the bone, they're easy to eat. I love to eat these, they're delicious. Here is an adorable piglet. It's wearing rain boots. And pigs are great animals. They're very intelligent and charming and they're clean. They're not dirty as you've been told. They like people a lot, they're very friendly. They're easy to get along with. A lot of people keep them as pets. So. When you, when you see the two sides of a food animal, you find yourself getting very confused about how you feel. <laughs> and, you know, I have this struggle with pork a lot. It's a difficult thing to figure out. Other people have different struggles. For instance, uh, you know, here's a kitten, and it's an adorable kitten, and I would love to hold and snuggle and pet this kitten, and I would even call it George. But there are some cultures in which it's just another form of protein. And so there will obviously be some conflict and some arguments about anybody's attempt to solve the meat crisis with kittens. Similarly, there's some salmon. Now in our region, the Pacific Northwest, this is a major, major source of protein. A huge food animal here is ingrained deeply in our culture. But to some people, these are sea kittens. <laughs> And you see this with pork, and you see this with fish, and you see this with beef, and you see this with spiders even. And you see it with millionaires. Wouldn't it be amazing if there was some animal that tasted delicious, that everyone wanted to eat, and that nobody anywhere wanted to pet, stroke, or be friends with? <laughs> While I was thinking on that problem, I was contacted by Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg. You all know who he is? He friended me on Facebook. He just friended me. And I wrote back, I said, do I know you? And he wrote back, he said, no bro, just a fan. Turns out, he had gotten a hold of the Cannibal's Guide to Ethical Living. He'd read it, he had absorbed it. He really wanted to talk to me about it because he really felt like he understood it and that it was important that we meet. And I was touched by that. I also found it a little creepy. And you know, I get that kind of thing on Facebook a lot and I don't want to just friend everybody. Everybody, you know, it's hard to figure out what to do on there sometime. Um, so I didn't do anything about it. I just kind of like left it in my little list and everything. And then like a week later I looked and I, did, I don't remember actually friending him, but the computer did a thing and it kind of blinked when I logged in and suddenly we're friends. And apparently there's an event that I had agreed to go to, to meet with Mark Zuckerberg to have a secret conference at an elite Palo Alto restaurant. <laughs> The things Mark Zuckerberg told me at that restaurant changed my life. I learned a lot about the man himself, and I learned a lot about his commitment to food security and ethics. What you may already know, because he was quite public about it, is that Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has made a pledge to only eat animals he killed with his own hands. So far, he has slaughtered a lobster, uh, a goat and a pig, he posted about that on Facebook. He said, I just killed a pig and a goat. It was a media event. What not everybody knows is that he actually killed the pig and the goat with one blow. 
Since then, he's killed several more pigs. He also befriended a sick baby giraffe, which died in his care. He ate that. <laughs> he felt okay with that. They were on good terms. Uh, he's also currently training to best a horse in unarmed combat. <laughs> when he's not eating meat, he killed himself. He sticks to a strict vegetarian diet. And even then, he gets deeply involved in the lives of the vegetables that he consumes. <laughs> because he believes that people need to know where food comes from. And that is something I'm behind 110%. Mark Zuckerberg knows that hunger is a growing problem. He knows that injustice is a growing problem. And he knows that injustice is leading to growing anger. And he's smart enough to recognize these growth opportunities for what they are. <laughs> that day at Hobie's, Mark Zuckerberg let me in on a secret. And it's what I'm here to show to you today, to release to you, the Chad watching public. Mark Zuckerberg asked me to become a spokesperson for his new company, Soylentis. <laughs> and I said yes. Let me tell you about Soylentis and what we are doing. Soylentis is the market leader in the field of in vitro meat, also known as cultured meat. We prefer to call it slide farming. <laughs> In our San Jose, California facilities, we've scaled up the ability to grow on a laboratory slide perfectly clean organic meat cells, which are then herded together by nanorobotic cow hands, if you will, <laughs> to form delicious chunks of lean, wholesome, satisfying meat. We've been working on it for a long time. You may be wondering where we're at with it. I'm going to show you the answer right now. Bring out the Zuckerbergers. <laughs> this is the Zuckerberger. It's green meat from Soylentis. We hope that you'll like it. It's organic. There are no hormones, pesticides. There are no antibodies of any kind. It's pure, clean, delicious, and satisfying. There are no animal contents, no pigs, no cows, no horses, not even spiders. It's pure, free range, wholesome, organic, Facebook CEO, Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> now, I know what you're thinking because we have done focus groups. The first question that so many people ask us about Zuckerberg is, why do you use the human genome? <laughs> to clone delicious, low-fat, satisfying meat for our families instead of uh, something more familiar, such as chickens or ducks or cats even? Well, the answer is complex. As I pointed out before, we've learned that human meat is actually the most nutritious and delicious meat there is. It's 35% more wholesome than pork. It contains all of the amino acids, fats, minerals, uh, trace elements that human bodies need to create other new human bodies because in fact it is human bodies of a completely <laughs> ethical form. More amazingly than that, we at Soylentis have also learned that the human muscle cell thrives in the unpleasant artificial conditions of the laboratory more than any other form of cell. Only human bodies can grow at the rate that we need to face the coming meat crisis. Fortunately, they are delicious. <laughs> the second question that we most frequently get about Zuckerbergers is, okay, say you have to use the human genome, why are you using the human genome of Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg? <laughs> why not someone more deserving, like Steve Jobs? <laughs> Well, at Soylentis, we believe that at this unprecedented opportunity to spread human cells throughout the most underfed and underserved areas of Facebook userdom, <laughs> we want to choose the cells of the man who was named Man of the Year by Time Magazine, the man who became America's youngest billionaire in history. <laughs> 
These cells have shown what they can do. Also, this is Mark Zuckerberg's way of saying thanks. Thanks to the world. Just as he always says thanks to the animals he eats. It's his way of giving back in the most complete and total way that he knows how. The last question we always get, what do they taste like? Well, <laughs> taste is a really subjective experience. Thank you. And the words to describe taste don't always exist in our language. <laughs> but to me, I would just have to say, it tastes like sunshine mixed with kittens with just a delicious hint of Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> We're excited to be rolling out this product. We hope that you're going to like it as much as we do, but this is just the beginning. In 2012, look for the ability to upload your own genome to your Facebook profile. You'll be able to serve yourself to your friends and loved ones, as well as create custom blends of genetic meat, which you can then use to create genetic sausages that you can sell online yourself for profit. We're also entering licensing deals that are going to be allowing you to, yes, taste the flesh of Steve Jobs, as well as the flesh of Bill Gates, as well as media figures such as Donald Trump, pop singer Katy Perry, and even world leaders. Here's Vladimir Putin. We're talking to him. Silvio Berlusconi is a possibility. All that and more is coming. Zuckerbergers, green meat from Soylentis. You're going to like it for a very limited time with every purchase of the cannibal's guide to ethical living you will receive a coupon good for two free zuckerburgers as soon as they are available in stores so won't you please help us to help you to help facebook ceo mark zuckerberg feed the world and save the kittens thank you